All right. Welcome back. We are all aware that this is the last session, so we're going to try and be efficient and effective. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having our panel. So this is on um, new questions in corporate finance, and I'm very pleased to have um, um, new, frontiers. new Frontiers. Sorry. New Frontiers. Okay. New frontiers, I'm exactly, exactly. Um, excellent. So um, we have three panelists, and we uh, basically cover some of the material that we saw before, but hopefully from different perspectives. Um, so Ama is going to talk about the role of corporate finance in some of the more macro trends um, that you know we have seen in the U.S. And then Christian and Marianne are going to talk about externalities of corporate finance and how to think about them, and in particular um, how to incorporate them in, go in governance. So, Amma, do you want to get started off? So, um, whoa, <laughs> that was funny. I saw all of you go. Um, so. You know, I want to start by just saying, you know, at an academic conference, we stand up and we, we present a paper. So that's kind of easy. So what are we trying to accomplish here? All I'm trying to do is to tell you what I've been reading lately and what I find interesting. That's it. And uh, I don't want to try to give the impression that the things I'm talking about, there already are not very good papers on either. So uh, I just want to qualify in that way. Um, when I think of corporate finance and I think of what the specialization and expertise of corporate finance scholars uh, is, I generally think of us as people among the broader set of e e economists as people who really know a lot about firms. Uh, we teach in stuff about valuation, about capital budgeting, obviously about the way firms finance themselves. Um, we work with data sets that involve publicly traded firms, venture capital backed firms, private equity backed firms. So I really hope that we can bring to the table when we interact with the broader economics community a real expertise on firms and the way they operate, the way they're financed, and what's going on on the production side of the economy. And so that's what I wanted to talk about, what I find most interesting on the production side of the economy and where there may be open questions for corporate finance scholars to really focus. Um, and I think there are some really fascinating trends on the production side of the economy uh, that we have a lot of excellent research and I'd like to see some more. So first and foremost, this was kind of alluded to a little bit earlier in the day, but I want to put it on the table because I think it's just so important, and that is the decline in productivity growth in most advanced economies since 2005. Um, this is a stunning fact. I think it is a fact that is not an artifact of mismeasurement. I think Chad Severson's JEP piece is very nice at laying out the arguments that this is not about mismeasurement. I, thought a lot, I think a lot of finance scholars just say, oh, we can't measure productivity. I think we can measure it well, and we know that it has been declining in almost all advanced economies since 2005. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that that's a huge deal. That represents direct productivity, uh, direct welfare losses given that we cannot any longer increase our output per input in the way that we used to. And I think that we need to, to think very carefully about what finance has to do with that pattern, because I think there's a lot of research on this in economics. Uh, I'd like to see more coming out of the corporate finance community in thinking about the allocation of capital, about why pri private equity and venture capital may not be offsetting this trend. Uh, and that's so I'm going to do a big a bit of a d deeper dive into that. Let me get to the other three. The second one is a closely related phenomenon, and that is the decline in business dynamism. Uh, this idea that's coming especially out of the work of John Haltewanger and, and co-authors, that we no longer are seeing the kind of churn uh, that we used to see both new firms coming in uh, and then the small firms getting big. Uh, and again, I think the data are pretty conclusive on that, although on that fact, I think we need more investigation. And I'd like to see other people using the census data, using other data to see how robust that fact is and also what finance might have to do with it. Um, the third pattern is something that I think is definitely more widely researched already, but I still think we need more, and that is the decline in investment to GDP ratios. That's something that we've seen over the last 30 to 40 years that's especially troubling given the decline in the cost of capital, and this is a little bit related to the discussion that Dick uh, had earlier about the work uh, of Niels and Killian, really fantastic work showing that, you know, even though the cost of uh, capital has surely fallen, hurdle rates remain high, firms aren't investing. Um, and 
we obviously have a lot of work on intangibles, on potentially market power, uh, thinking about the work by Cruze and Eberly or Thomas Philippone and others. Uh, so we have a lot of research on that subject, but I still feel like when I read that literature, I don't have a solid understanding yet of exactly what can per, uh, explain this pervasive decline. Um, and then the fourth topic uh, that I think is really super interesting is the aggregate shifts in value added across advanced economies. Most of us know the basic ones. If we look at advanced economies over the last 40 years, we know that there's been a substantial decline in value added coming from the manufacturing sector. I think we all kind of know that. And we also know that there's been a massive increase in the value added uh, coming from professional services. And that's true pretty much across all the advanced economies, not just the US. The one that I did not know when I was looking at the data and is quite striking is that second to professional services, there's been a sharp increase in value added from the real estate sector in advanced economies. Uh, this is particularly pronounced, for example, for example, in Italy and Spain. And again, I don't think that's widely explored in the finance literature. And I think that one almost has to do something with finance. You know, whether you want to think about cause or effect, we know that the amount of financing that has moved from traditional businesses toward the real estate sector has been tremendous, both on the re residential side and the commercial real estate side. So um, I think I would like to see, uh, just to, uh, again, repeat them, decline in productivity growth, decline in business dynamism, decline in investment to GDP ratio, and the shift in value added away from the manufacturing. And as I'm saying them out loud, I kind of realize that I have a dour personality, and these are all kind of more negative trends. And I think the reason why I think it's so interesting is because it contrasts with some of the things we think are happening in finance. For example, the rise in private equity, the rise in venture capital. I agree with Steve that the evidence from uh, Steve Davis's work does seem to suggest higher revenue productivity. I think that's a big distinction, by the way. It does not show higher technical efficiency or cost efficiency, but it does show private equity is associated with higher revenue productivity. And so it seems to contrast with some of these facts in an interesting way, and I'd like to see some reconciliation of that. So it's late, and I wanted to keep it short, so I'm going to uh, hand the mic off. Those, that's, those, those are the things I, I'm interested in and curious to hear people's thoughts. Okay, so um, I admit I was pretty nervous when I saw the title New Frontiers, and I was sort of wondering what I would have to say about the new frontiers of corporate finance. And I, you know, talked to Ragu, and he said, you know, a lot of times new stuff happens at the sort of when related fields touch and at the, at the fringe. So think of my comments as coming from the fringe. Although, you know, after Luigi's comments, you know, maybe they're not so fringy uh, <laughs> after all. Um, <laughs> So when I was thinking, I started very similar to Armour. I was thinking about it like, what is corporate finance? It, it, it is fundamentally about corporate activities. And you know, there's the production side that Armour talked about. There's financing. And financing is obviously something that we've studied for a long, long time. Think leverage, dividends, and so on. And so what could be there be sort of new and interesting about corporate activities? And here, I think one fairly obvious addition is the one that Luigi already alluded to is sort of uh, recognizing that firms' activities can have sort of, you know, social consequences and have uh, ex external effects. And um, now, again, externalities is not a new concept, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, finance and econ haven't thought a lot about externalities. But what I think is, is new, at least, we're, I think, coming more to terms with is how common, ubiquitous, and large some of these externalities are, right? And so I think the obvious ones are maybe climate and environment, but I think there's more. Think about social media and recent sort of studies coming out uh, about the effects on teenage girls, right? Think about the opioid epidemic. Think about concentration of market power in large firms and what it could mean potentially for you know, innovation and productivity. And you know, large firms and their effects sort of on local communities when the headquarters far away and people that make the decisions are sort of you know very far away. So I think there's, I think these once you start looking, I get the sense that these externalities are actually quite common and large. And to give you one more sort of statistic for that is we were recently doing 
a, a super simple sort of exercise, but I think it's an interesting one, where we're using basically um, emissions from corporate activities. So think about these, what people call scope one, or direct emissions from corporate um, activities. If you monetize them with the social cost of carbon, Lars told us we gotta take all these estimates with a rock of salt, they're really tricky. But you know, if you take the current EPA one, you get that for US companies, the, just the carbon externalities or basically 25% of their operating profits. Now that's on average, the median is much, much smaller, um, but again, it sort of gives you a sense, if you again value weight, this, this would be the average, it's, it's non-trivial. So, the average is 25, and the median, Yeah, 20 to 25 is what you get. And it's highly skewed because there's some really big contributors and some, you know, many, many much smaller contributors. So once you think that these externalities are economically large, I think there's lots of interesting or important questions that um, come up. And, you know, Lu uh, Luigi's point about, you know, can we let firms maximize profits is, uh, is sort of an obvious question. And Marianne's going to talk more about um, that. Um, so what I wanted to talk about that's a little closer to home is sort of one thing that we want to probably do is measure these externalities in, in certain ways. And I see a lot of efforts from the various data providers and rating agencies to measure this. And there is obviously a lot of issues with these measurements and also, again, agency problems for these intermediaries that I think are going to be interesting. On the accounting side, there's a lot of efforts to uh, push corporate uh, reporting on sustainability, uh, and in particular, not just of what it means in terms of risks to, for the investors, but also the impacts that companies have on the society and, and the environment. And then sort of related to some of the stuff that I've been thinking about and working on is this tendency to address externalities through targeting corporate activities by transparency. So it's kind of partly coming out of frustration that you know, it seems like the traditional tools that we've had is like command and control type regulation or maybe market-based approaches like taxing uh, these activities seem to be difficult to do, especially in the climate space. And so instead what we're resorting towards is sort of this idea of using disclosure regulation. And the extent to which this actually works or doesn't work and what effects that might have I think is an interesting um, issue to study. This second sort of related to that, if you think about who knows about these external effects, you would think that there's pretty significant um, asymmetric um, sort of uh, information or information asymmetry in the sense that firms will often know a lot better about their impacts than the communities would be or, or the outsiders would be, right? And it, moreover, it will often take a long, long time for us to understand these externalities, right? So think about tobacco or Luigi has an, an interesting paper in Denmark uh, where they look at the effects of incinerators on cancer rates and there you have a lag of like 10 or 20 years uh, until we're sort of learning about this. In fracking, the EPA in 2016 came out and said we can't find much evidence that, that there's systematic impact on surface and groundwater. You look in the 2020s and subsequently there's work that basically says yes there is effects on both groundwater and there's on surface water. And so in my mind that raises I think a lot of issues that again are pertinent to corporate finance and to um, put one on the table I think there's a really interesting connection to the license to operate that firms get from society, right? So we let firms engage in these new activities often with maybe in the beginning relatively little constraints because we want them to create jobs. We want them to come up with new products, new services. And so there's sort of the positive effects of innovation. Uh, and in addition, we're giving them limited liability so that firms can, in, you know, people can invest with sort of limited risk and they're not necessarily losing, you know, their entire home and, and, and future livelihood. But that limited liability allows you to sort of offload potentially some of the consequences uh, onto society when things go badly. And there's some interesting work, if you think about the you know, um, Apple and Aki paper in the JF that kind of you know, shows that that um, is to some extent happening. And I think it raises super interesting questions when it comes to corporate charters, bankruptcy, restructuring, where, where we've studied this more from a like maximizing firm value type of perspective or maybe the debt holders versus the, the, the equity holders. But I think these 
trade-offs might change substantially once you sort of think about these externalities being uh, potentially uh, large. And then maybe one um, last comment is it also connects with corporate taxation, right? So um, Luigi and I, a little while ago, sort of talked about that maybe that could also be one reason why we have double taxation on the income side for farms, or at least we should think about this, or you know, could we think about how maybe farms should get taxed on some idea of Pigouvian taxes and expectation, and as we learn more about these externalities, we adjust these, these taxes. So the, the, I, again, these are, I think, corporate um, finance type questions. And then related to this private equity debate and what we were talking about earlier, that private equity has a lot more assets under their control, um, but yet operating with relatively little sort of transparency, there's sort of an interesting question in my mind, again, whether there's a quid pro quo where we give the license to operate, but at the same time we also want certain information so we can actually learn about some of these external effects that uh, corporate activities could have. So let me stop here, turn it over to Marianne. Great. I have, first, thanks to the organizer, I have very, very little to add uh, because what I was going to say was covered under open questions rather than new frontiers. Um, so I'll, I'll try, though, to, you know, so I, I think I'm, I'm going to join the rank of, you know, of Luigi, so I'm going to be part of the heretics um, out there. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, kind of we have a problem. So you picked one of the, one of the Kent uh, Clark Center, Clark Kent, Kent Clark Center? question, I, I think there was a better one where there was actually a huge amount of consensus among you know, a broad set of economists. Now, I'll just read the question so they can all hear it. You know, it, is, it is best for society if the management of US publicly traded corporations only considers the impact of the decisions on customers, employees, and committee members to the extent that these impacts feedback um, to impact shareholder wealth. So they're essentially kind of asking economists, if, if firms Managers of firms do exactly what Friedman asked them to do, you know, kind of 50 years ago. Would that lead to what's best for society? And essentially, everybody except Steve um, kind of disagreed. Kind of disagreed with this statement. Um, so I think there is much more, kind of much more consensus. I think among economists that something, you know, kind of something is just not right. And, and I think it's useful to kind of put back in my mind, kind of Friedman kind of came to this. I think with a very, you know, kind of foundations that were really in the ideas that markets are perfect, the markets look like our Econ 101 markets, and then in those kind of markets, the ideas of focusing on, you know, maximizing profits, delivering the best value to consumers at the low lowest cost possible, what's, what's going to be best, like in a very kind of like Adam Smith uh, kind of way. And I think it's very clear that, you know, kind of markets are not, you know, are not perfect. If you look at the kind of comments that economists made as to why they disagreed with this statement, they had to do with asymmetry of information, right? So sometimes you can lie to your customers about what exactly, you know, they're buying. They had to do with, you know, kind of what Christian talked about, which is sectionalities. They also had to do with, with labor, and I want to go back and talk more about labor. Um, that's a market that I think, compared to those days, we very much understand is a very, very imperfect market. And I think it's really important to stress kind of the impact, you know, so you showed some of the, you know, the time series of what has been, you know, happening over time, that the, the Friedman message, the Jensen message, had a really, really large impact on, you know, kind of what has been going on for the last, you know, for the last 50 years. Um, and I think we know some of the channels via which it's happened. It happened because of the fact that we do this research and the research gets taught to MBA students and these MBA students become consultants and they go to firms and they go and tell these firms this is the way you should be doing things. So I think I want to just really stress the importance of the research and hence when I go to like what should we be doing next, we should not be, you know, just saying, well, we don't know how to do anything different. So, you know, I think we just have to be much more aggressive about, you know, trying to think further. I want to talk about, you know, the labor market side of things. And, you know, I want to be, I don't, I don't want to focus so much on like the extreme outrageous things that, you know, kind of Luigi talked about. But as a, so, someone is essentially just doing labor, you know, the kind of thing that we talk about in labor is just the decline of the labor share. It's a stagnation of wages for all the workers, you know, for, for, for most workers in the economy. 
There's an amazing graph which I showed at you know kind of an yields conference last Friday, which is a graph on productivity output per worker that I don't know who showed it, maybe it was Luigi, and you put on top of that graph what happened to the medium wage, and you can see productivity and medium wage tracking each other until 1980, and then really starting diverging. Party kept on going up, wages were stagnant. And I think the, the, the possibility at least that the change that have happened inside of the corporations in how these corporations are being managed, it having played an important role in those trends, I think cannot be, you know, cannot be underestimated. I don't think I can pinpoint one paper showing that, but you know, kind of certainly, you know, kind of that's that's a very, very strong uh, that's a very strong possibility. Um, I think that we have, you know, good sense, a good sense that a lot of the, the decisions that are being made uh, inside of firms. So think about the shocks that have you know, hit the labor markets, whether they are technology or they are trade. The responses of most firms has been to essentially kind of displace the workers in light of these shocks. I mean, all the work that's been done on trade in China, the China shock has been what? Well, firms just shut down and move the operation somewhere else. Whenever we have kind of new technologies coming in, there's a sense that firms, because they're always eager to try to maximize profit, even you know, sometimes in the short term, would instead, instead of like trying to use this technology to complement workers and make workers more productive, are instead using these technologies to you know, substitute workers with, uh, with the technology. So I think this is super important. I think this is related to the way you know, corporations are being managed. And I think the implications go beyond you know, kind of the wages that workers have, but I think they are much bigger when we think about political economy and you know the, deli the decline in trust in you know in the markets and in institutions and political change and um, and democracy. So maybe I'm exaggerating, but I think that some of the things that you know kind of are happening right now are you know kind of really um, existential for many questions. So what you know what do I think we should do different? I don't know, this is open questions, but I just want to examine some of the things. So Eric asked the question, so what else could we do? Well, again, you know, 50 years ago, Jensen told us that this is a certain way we should incentivize CEOs, which was very different from the way we're doing in the past, rather than just saying, well, we don't know how to do it, let's just put the effort, let's just think about it. And I think we understand what the issues are, right? It's measurement, which Christine has talked about, even more complicated when it comes to things like, you know, workers and, you know, the S part of things, but, you know, it's measurement and it's dealing with multitasking. And, you know, going back to, you know, kind of the reason why Steve said I disagree with, you know, this statement was not because Steve felt like we have no externalities. I think it's because he felt like there's no way to do it better than the way we're doing it right now, which was the way that Jensen told us to do it. And I think that's just, you know, a little lame. You know, kind of, we are researchers and we should, you know, we should try to do better. I'd love to have, you know, kind of more thinking about long-termism. This is an area that I don't know much about, but we certainly think that the idea of incentivizing for the longer term is better than incentivizing for the short term. A lot of the investments that, you know, would be happening in workers if firms had a longer term orientation would likely be happening if, you know, CEOs didn't have to show results for, you know, for the next quarter. So how do we do that? How do we think about the boardroom and who we put in the boardroom? We think that career concerns are super important. Board members, you know, don't want to leave a company that has, a, that has got shitty results. Who are the people that we put in the boardroom in terms of trying to get uh, more of this longer term orientation? I know nothing about accounting, but one would think that there are good questions when it comes to accounting. You know, there's some research, I think, on whether moving away from quarterly earnings report to you know, kind of um, earnings report that would be kind of more distant over time would make a difference. I'd love to see uh, kind of more work uh, in this direction. It might be a bit heretic, but I think the ideas of thinking not just about who we put in the boardroom in terms of, you know, the age or the profile of these board members, but like thinking about the composition and whether we want to bring other stakeholders in the boardroom, I think is worth, you know, having more conversation about, right? So one data point, you know, going back to the China shock, there's good research that shows that the U.S., you know, dealt particularly poorly with the China shock in terms of the implications, uh, in terms of, you know, kind of losing jobs. Germany did a much better job than, than the U.S. did. Lots of different factors that could explain that, but one of them could have been that these boardrooms were different and had more kind of workers willing to think with the management as to how we could turn what was a bad thing into, uh, into um, an opportunity. And then I think I see very little work on alternatives to the corporations. I think that you know, very few people are looking really at benefit corporations 
you know, I'm not saying that we want to have more benefit corporations, but it would be great to see kind of more research, thinking about how they can exist, how they can coexist with different kind of corporations, how they can, you know, kind of really manage to succeed even when they become traded, which, you know, I think has been, um, has been very difficult. And then finally, and that's really kind of um, going back to some of the things that Lubosch has been, you know, has been talking about, um, I'd love to see much more research about how we can enable shareholders that have values that would like the corporations to behave differently to be able to, you know, kind of exert their voice. And I think this is an area where I think some of the, the, the research in behavioral economics could be particularly useful. I mean, these are, you know, complicated decisions that we ask shareholders, you know, to make. You know, not the most exciting things to do on a Friday night to think about way I'm going to vote on this proxy or that proxy. But can we think about, you know, kind of choice architecture and things like that to really enable shareholders that have values and would like corporations to behave differently, whether it is about, you know, internalizing externalities or kind of investing in their workers to really be able to, you know, kind of um, um, say those things. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. As you can see, corporate finance not going to be boring um, going forward. Um, and lots of uh, interesting questions to work on. Let me, you know, take the prerogative of being, you know, kind of the timekeeper here to say two things in response, because I think what all these comments show, right, is that there's huge amount of work to be done, <laughs> obviously. But I think it also, at least in my mind, it really shows the tension we have in thinking about on the one hand, there is markets that seem to be actually functioning better and better. And I think also we have understood that the private sector, once certain incentives are being set, optimizes much better against it than the public sector. Um, and in my mind, at least, I think, you know, in a, in a broad sense, um, maybe it's a failure of the, you know, of the fault line between private sector optimization and how the the how regulation and the public sector has been able to react to it so for example if you think about you know a lot of the things that also in luigi's session was mentioned in here too I, a lot of the abuses in say in private equity in terms of um, you know, student loan market or, um, you know, kind of healthcare market, et cetera, right, is often actually a failure of designing a good system that gives the private sector the right incentives. Now, of course, some of, you know, these regulations are also endogenous, but, you know, somewhere they have to, they have to come from, right? And what I mean is, for example, if you look at, you know, student loan market is particularly egreg egregious. And there it wasn't necessarily just private equity lobbying against um, making student loans itself depend on the performance of the, of the universities that are receiving these, um, these type of loans. Um, some of it was just literally bureaucratic failure in how this was managed when, you know, I, I see, um, you, know, um, you know, some people uh, nodding here. Now, you know, so I, I feel that going forward, especially in corporate finance, um, we need to learn, we need to do much more research on how the interface between the, the private sector and better regulation and the public sector can happen. Because, and I think this is true also, say, you know, Marianne was just saying, right, about the underinvestment into the labor force. But we know that in a competitive market, individual firms really cannot invest in the labor force, um, even if they have long run incentives. Maybe that work, you know, I mean, you can say some of my intuition is built also in developing countries, right? But you look at India early on, if you look at the top firms in India, they, in, like the, you know, kind of the IT firms, they invested massively in their own um, labor because they had so much rents. And the market in India for these firms were not you know, the, the labor market was not competitive, so you actually had enough rents to invest in, in your own um, labor force. As soon as that market became competitive, right, that collapsed. And so in some sense, that's a little bit how I see the U.S. over the last 50 years, is that this country had so much rents because the rest of the developed world were just not competing with the U.S., that a lot of things were possible at the firm level, which 
I think actually ultimately society has to also solve in co basically the public sector in combination with the private sector. Um, and I think investing in labor, mar in labor is one. I mean, just investing in education. Think about how poor investment in education in the US has been, right, in even high school education. And the other thing I just want to say is that why I think this is so important is that many of the really big productivity you know, investments Amma was you know, hinting at will probably be things that individual corporations cannot solve. If you think about you know, um, investments in sustainable energy, the, the grid that needs to be invested in, the same is true in biotech. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of this if you look at universities, right? I, I look at MIT, right? It's a university that literally is at the center in, in Chicago the same way, right? But we see that basically research has really moved into like a government industrial complex. It's billions of dollars every year, right? That, that where corporations funding plus you know, government funding meets in the middle of a, of, of a research university. And so the more we can understand how to set the incentives on all the, on, you know, for the firms and for, um, you know, kind of for, for the design of keeping the dynamism within the firms alive, but endogenizing these externalities that have been talked about, I think you know, those are really big issues. Now, the one hopeful thing I have is that Given the type of data we now have um, available to look inside the firm, hopefully we will be able to, to think better about these type of design issues. Let me stop there too and maybe let you know, the panelists r respond to each other um, and then I open it up for questions. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about just the overall theme, and this came up in, in some of the other sessions again, and it's almost like there's like a pendulum swim, swing that's happening in, in some sense. I think I agree with a lot of what Steve's presentation was saying about really the success of governance and the success of profit maximization, and I think we shouldn't discount that, that that's something that is, you know, was really important for boosting growth, boosting productivity, and I think, I think all of us are kind of hinting at issues that like, okay, well, what happens when you've got a well-functioning governance system where CEOs are really about maximizing profits, uh, and I forgot who it was that said, maybe I think Luigi, on Luigi's slide, he said, you know, maybe there's some downsides to that, and I think that's what we're all kind of struggling with, which what, it, what are the downsides? sides of that. Um, and I, I think that the only way we're really going to get at that is good conceptual frameworks and good, um, and good data. And so I just wanted to, you know, say that one of the questions, like, I, I actually think one of the margins that we need to do more research on, which I, I'm starting to get really interested in, is, is just the idea of what firms do to generate more demand conditional on output and how important that is. You know, this shows up in the intangibles arguments and this shows up in a lot of different areas. Um, but, you know, I think we still kind of think a lot of economists on the production side think like Henry Ford, like we're producing cars and we're just gonna make it as productive as possible. And technical efficiency is what we're gonna go after and that's what generates growth. I just don't think that really well describes what, what's going on inside most of firms right now. And I think corporate finance people, if we get our hands on the right data and the right conceptual frameworks, can really make some headway on trying to understand what's happening inside firms that backs these revenues, the revenue productivity measures, and is it the kind of thing that's improving technical efficiency and, and uh, factor productivity that ultimately leads to real GDP growth? And if there's a gap between those two things, that's something that could happen in a very well-governed, profit-maximizing society, but maybe that's not exactly social welfare-maximizing. You know, I think that's a, that's a question. It's out there in the literature. I'm not saying things people haven't said, but I think corporate finance people, I hope, because ultimately, I think it's about the allocation of capital, right? I think banks will start lending to firms that might not be technically efficient, but have figured out how to get you to buy their products. And if that happens on a wide scale, you might worry that the allocation of capital is no longer kind of promoting productivity growth. Instead, it's promoting really good brands and really good people, you know, and maybe that's welfare maximizing, who knows, but I don't think it's what we think of when we think of Henry Ford getting those cars produced uh, in a much more efficient manner. So just to underscore uh, one point and then maybe add one small additional is I think this, 
market failure versus regulation is a little bit of a false dichotomy because as Antoinette was saying, it's like most of the time I think what we're seeing is sort of this interaction of government regulation with some high powered incentives and then that's when things go wrong. And I think what's, what is special about perhaps finance here is that finance not only has these high powered incentives but it also has economies um, of scale. And where you, for instance, see this is like, you know, index funds have been hugely successful and they've grown, but they've raised, I think, a really interesting now governance issues when index funds and private equity funds together, you know, control potentially, what is it, 30, 40% of the economy. Um, and then at the same time, we're now leaning more and more on markets to fix problems that we think maybe governments are not fixing. There becomes a real question also of sort of the political economy of this, but also democratic legitimacy, which we saw with you know BlackRock getting a lot of pushback. And you can, again, also see this with some of the other responses that we see when the SEC is now taking on climate. There's sort of the question, is it, if we're using sunlight to drive change, is the SEC the right agency to sort of drive that kind of change? And who gets to decide what change we're actually driving? Or should this come from you know, an EPA or some other institutions that have sort of more of, of a, a political legitimacy in that space. I mean, we, we go back and forth uh, on the objectives of the corporation, right? I mean, Adam Smith was angry with the corporation because it was managed by stewards of the shareholders, and they didn't do a good job. So he was talking about agency way back then. And, and then Burnley and Means were talking about, you know, how the corporation was not being run for the owners, and that was terrible, but this was after the Robin Bar Robert Barron period when the corporation was run for the owners, and that was terrible also. So uh, I, I guess the question is, are we always going to go back and forth? And is the real problem not so much the incentives at the top, but more that once you have a large entity, survival becomes important. And, you know, that raises the question, is survival you know, worse when it's actually making profits and uh, actually has less concern about its survival versus when it's actually making losses and there's an allocation issue over and above the fact that it's trying desperately to manipulate the political system to get it to survive. So uh, I guess this goes back to Steve. Maybe the point is that we've sort of moved towards better allocation within the firm, but there's still the big question of you know what these guys are doing on the external side. I mean, if I can just say one quick comment on that, which is, I completely agree that you know we don't want to base our decisions on policy or whether the corporate sector is doing well or not based on who who's upset versus who isn't, right? I mean, someone's going to be upset usually in almost every regime. Um, I focus. I tend to focus. That's why the productivity growth number is the one I I care most. At the end of the day, that's the one that. If, if, if you're to say there's a problem with the corporation sector, that's the one I will point to first. And then, then you do see a lot of people don't like corporations. You see labor share declining. You see people voting for Trump. You see all these other things. And so you think maybe these things have something to do with each other. So, so when I think of uh, market failures and externalities you know, of corporations, I, th I think the number one thing that comes into to my mind is a topic that Amir actually talked about, which is productivity growth, right? So there's a huge body of economic research that thinks through, you know, how come that we have growth in the first place? How come that we achieve productivity growth? And, and the vast majority of these models that are now, starting with Paul Roman, Bob Lucas, and then many more, point to the externalities that are, uh, that, that are inherent in knowledge creation. Uh, where firms create knowledge, but then they don't, uh, you know, accrue all the profits from the knowledge creation and from the training that they put in their workers. Right? These workers go to some other corporations or found new corporations uh, to do whatever they have learned at the previous uh, at the previous companies. And so, productivity growth very much comes from these externalities. Everybody in the world has been trying to copy Silicon Valley. And it's, it's not just one company, it's many companies that work there, right? And you can find many, many more instances of that sort, right? The German car industry and so forth. So productivity is the engine of it all, and that's the, ex that's the number one externality. And we should be glad in some ways that companies don't uh, internalize 
all of it, right? And maybe they're internalizing more, and maybe that explains part of the productivity growth uh, slowdown. Sorry. Um, so I mean, that may be an interesting question to go after, but it's these knowledge spillovers that are absolutely key. And uh, where's the where's the CO two CO two emissions as an externality? Uh, I mean, for years, economists and there's a b large body of literature have, have have said how to solve that. We know how to solve that, and that's just by doing proper carbon pricing and and uh, and making sure that we that we uh, that we have a proper market in these things. Now, why governments don't do this and why they don't set the carbon price at the at whatever you know price somebody might like is an interesting question, but that strikes me as a failure of governments and not a failure of corporations. And to go out and say we need to fix that problem by doing some co some correction here, some correction there, and having that agency come, uh, you know, come and do some stuff. I mean, that creates even more inefficiencies than we want. We know what the efficient solution is. The efficient solution is carbon pricing, and there are years and years of papers arguing that point, and, you know, you, you know, now we can go back and argue why that's not happening. So it seems to me, and in related to this, right, I mean, there's no surprise that it's the developing, the developed countries, right, that, that clamor for uh, environmental protection that are worried about uh, environmental change that are do that are worried about climate change right you see people in germany gluing themselves to the streets over that i don't see anybody in china gluing themselves to the street over that or in india and it's pretty clear why their productivity just isn't on the level of the advanced uh, countries and it's n and because it's not on the level that they're, they're doing survival right i mean china, the first thing they want to do in china is feed themselves and the first thing they want to do in india is feed themselves so the the, the route forward is creating productivity growth on a global scale and making sure that China and India can be as rich as possible and then uh, and, 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 and then uh, you know the the, 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 the the global emissions probably can be handled as an afterthought so I think we we all pretty much I think agree that you know kind of la the lack of carbon pricing is you know kind of a government failure the problem is that like I don't when we talk about government failure you know kind of there's a reason why we're not you know pricing carbon. This is a more complicated one because of the global aspect, but there are tons of papers looking at the political economy of like why we did not succeed in getting a carbon trade system at a federal level in the US, and we can go over it. And it has a lot to do with what we're talking about, which is like a lot of corporations have a lot at stake. They're trying to maximize their profits, and they lobbied, what was the number, like a thousand lobbyists in 1994 against, you know, a cap and trade system. So it goes back to like, you know, Friedman 1970, Stigler 1971. So I think the tension there, to me, is kind of like probably the, the disconnect between what some of these companies are doing with my money, pretty much, a lot of all's money, and I think that a lot of us in the room would pretty decide, I think, but again, that's an area where we need more research. Someone mentioned this before. How much really are we willing to give up in terms of the returns on our investment to know that we're investing in a money in our money in a company that is, you know, kind of internalizing, you know, pollution. If we had research I would really document that we are indeed willing to give up a lot, then I think we have a disconnect between what the corporation, the agent, is doing with our money and no good mechanism for us as, you know, as shareholders, as investors in this company to, you know, kind of get those companies to do exactly what we want, which gets back to like, how do we make it easier for us, you know, as shareholders to really just express our views outside of, you know, the political system where it's kind of not working because of, you know, Stigler and such. <coughs> just one quick comment. I. <coughs> I think many of the questions, the interesting questions you guys all asked, has one plausible explanation, and it's what we behavioral types call status quo bias. I, I think we just get stuck in ruts. I remember a paper Amit was working on back in the good old days when he was here about uh, mortgage lenders saying, no, you're not qualified for a fixed rate mortgage, but yeah, we can fix you up with a variable rate mortgage. Now, that's idiotic, unless you've always had a rule that your income has to exceed 30% or whatever. And uh, I, I don't wanna go through the whole list, but 
I'd invite you all to think about how many of these things we could just think about COVID. How all of a sudden we realized maybe you don't have to fly all the way across the country for a one-hour meeting. So I, I, I think that lots of stuff, if we throw everything away and start over, we'd get some ideas. I mean, I think that reminds another version of the study school bears, and maybe this has changed. But I remember in the early days of Rustandi, we had like meetings to try to talk about you know, kind of ENG investing. And we had these guys that were like talking to people and, you know, to try to kind of get them, you know, to invest their money. And they felt like they could not have a conversation where, you know, you could be doing good, but have, you know, a little bit of a monetary cost to it, that this was just would not fly. That sounds like another kind of like state of school bias to me. But ultimately, I mean, as scientists, right, we want to test it. We, c we can stipulate a lot of things, but these are real important um, empirical questions that we need to understand. Because I think you know, we might want demand to be different from, or more, more virtuous than it actually is, right? So we, we, I think it's, it's ultimately really important to, to see this as a research agenda, not a political agenda that then you know, kind of science becomes an outlet of political opinions, right? Two, two quick things. I wanted to, I said earlier, I mentioned supply chain, which I realize is not an exciting term, but I want to phrase that in terms of productivity. So I sat in the, the group that did the baby formula and this and that and the other th for the last two years that we had shortages on. We cannot restock ammunition without the supply chain for our, all of DOD without supply chain from China. We don't have airplane replacement parts. We don't have the right steel grade for doing all the EV. We don't have transformers to do the wires everywhere, nor do we have labor. We, we, could, that we could keep going. We don't have nuts and bolts, which is not about scaling up the innovation. It's about, it's about just the nuts and bolts of there's hold up on everything we do because it's the supply chains are backlogged. The Mississippi River is going down. Not only does the stuff not come out, but we can't get the fertilizer up to the farmers, right? There are all these things that are going on in the supply chain that, that need to interact with the labor shortage and the need for understanding what labor is contributing to the firm. So I guess that my question is, do we know if whether, I mean, we don't ever talk about supply chain value chain in finance, but do we know however in, any of these things relate to, to productivity and to the, the idea of where labor is contributing in, in whatever rents they're able to get out of the firm. Yeah, so this is a, this is a great question that, um, you know, he's my co-author, so I feel bad selling his stuff so much. But I think like Ernest Liu at, at Princeton, this is his entire research agenda. You know, his job market paper was all about, it reminds me a little bit what Harold's talking about too. He has a recent paper with Song Ma talking about R&D and what would be optimal relative to what you see in the private sector given that there are positive externalities to R&D. And the thing I would encourage people like fi a finance audience, and I want to you know, really encourage the PhD students to think in this area, is if you actually look at the conceptual frameworks, they're wedges based on frictions in the first order conditions based on where in the supply chain you are. And those wedges then determine whether if you have financial frictions, whether you need policy intervention or not. So that's not exactly the more industrial policy like trying to get Silicon Valley. That's a different problem. Um, but my point is that sounds a lot like corporate finance, right? That's like a central question in corporate finance. Why? I, I, I think we need to be more central in that. Now, Ernest is in Bentheim Center, so he's, he's a financial economist. And other people here, Emanuele, other people have been working on these questions. So I'm not saying there isn't research, but I think the supply chain issue is fundamentally related to wedges in an uh, in, in input-output matrix based on financial frictions. And so that should be something we should be front and central in. And I don't think we are as much as we should be. Um, but, you know, anytime you do industrial policy, I love the quote, I'll steal it from Atif. He said, you know, industrial policy is a little bit like brain surgery. Sometimes you need it but you better be damn sure you know how to do it before you do it, right? And I think that's kind of why people are always nervous about industrial policy and the government trying to create another Silicon Valley, because um, that's, that's hard to do. Why do you say that the supply chain problems are financially, are due to financial frictions? 
What I meant to say is Ernest Liu's job market paper assumes there are financial frictions. There are borrowing constraints on firms in the standard way that we would model them. And then asks where in the supply chain would you want to intervene to get the biggest bang for your buck if you're a policymaker. So I, I wasn't saying that the supply chain issues are because of financial constraints. I'm just saying that in a model in which you think there are financial constraints, it immediately has implications for where in the supply chain you would want to intervene. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. That's so, to totally right. Actually, it might be a good thing that we have this problem so that we don't have a war with China because. <laughs> So trade sometimes is good in that dimension. Anyway, I, I completely agree with what uh, Marianne said, except for one thing, that she, in the positive and the negative, gives too much power to the world of ideas. And this is, I don't think that we change the world. I think that uh, who wanted to change the world use us as an excuse. No. Uh, so let, let me give you my, my theory. I may be wrong, but uh, what I think is the moment... The, ta the marginal tax rate went down. Uh, CEOs wanted to have a way to be paid more. And, uh, you know, it's very hard also from a public image point of view to say, I'm going to double my salary. So we have to have a good story. And the story that we do incentives and to do, uh, it sounded uh, fantastic. And uh, 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 Jensen and Murphy was, uh, is not how much, but how you do it is the greatest marketing paper for CEOs uh, and uh, was used and part of the silliness of public uh, citation is because really appealed to a real demand from a powerful group to vest our interests. Now the CEO are actually more interested in climate change. Why? Because actually some of the objectives are easy to reach. And so in their pay, they start to put climate change. Why? Because you reach them with probability one. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have to be careful. The, we are not at the center of the universe. At no. the universe. However, the message you say is very important. We have to be careful with what we do yeah. because it can be misused. So I think, I think most of the work that we do is totally irrelevant and you know, doesn't change anything in the world. I would say that this is one case where the idea had you know, kind of had consequences. And again, I'm not saying this is all bad, but um, and, you know, they're, they're, I think what you're saying is that our ideas sometimes come from a certain place because they are, they are the ideas that are demanded at the moment and the ideas themselves might be you know, endogenous to a broader context. I mean, the best paper that I know of on the idea, the, the, the demonstration of ideas of consequences is paper by Suresh Nidu on the main institute uh, and the training of, uh, of lawyers, my, my the main institute and training. That's, I think, a really good, you know, kind of demonstration that, you know, I think has nothing to do with, you know, the endogeneity or anything like that. So just to add one point to that, I mean, you're kind of like, in this case, the glass is half empty guy. Let me sort of just say, you know, I think the glass is half full in the following sense. I totally see the market for excuses. It's like I've worked in regulations even worse there. I think that, you know, every paper you put out could be used in some form or shape to, you know, support certain um, regulation or so. So it's, it's a problem. But one thing that I think we as a profession probably could do a better job is not just think about the knowledge production, but also the communication of our knowledge and how we aggregate knowledge and some of the insights, right? So this is in part what, you know, I think motivated Anil's idea for creating the expert panels um, in, in the Clark Center. But we could be much more institutional about this. This is, again, a collective action problem. But if you think about what medicine does, right, they're much more structured in the way they aggregate their evidence and then put that out. And I think that structure they created around their um, their sort of evidence and how it gets aggregated is one reason why I think there's more success in evidence-based medicine than we've had with evidence-based policy making. It's not the only reason not everything in medicine is great, but I think being more deliberate about this and controlling the message and how we aggregate ev evidence would make a difference in terms of the problem you're alluding to. I think the other, the other reason why I think you're wrong is that unlike, you know, people that teach PhD students, we teach MBA students. 
and they go straight into the workplace and you know whatever we teach them you know I think really you know kind of really matters. I still have students that tell me well Milton, Milton Friedman says I should maximize profits hence I should lie if I can lie um, that goes that that's like a failure of of education I think. But it's not even what Milton Friedman would say so I mean, you know, kind no, of they like, they it's like, a real like, failure of like education. Milton, they like Milton Friedman. They would say, well, I have to maximize profit at all costs. We still have students that say those things after two years in the MBA program. That's a failure on us. Okay, so uh, a great uh, set of uh, ideas to think about. It's, it's pretty daunting because it seems like we have, as a profession, underinvested in market design, uh, at least theoretically, uh, maybe overinvested too much in figuring out debt versus equity, but let's leave that aside. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, measurement around uh, environment, uh, which is one of the pillars around which you all discuss stuff. What about other societal elements? Does finance have any role in that? And measurement there is even harder. Uh, we have had a lot of discussion about climate uh, but the pressing issues are not just in climate, and I didn't hear much about uh, any of those. I, I know that it's harder, but you know, you are on the panel, so I get to ask the question. I mean, I, I liked, Lubos gave a great answer to one of the questions before when he was talking, where is Lubos, is he still here? Yeah, he gave a great answer to one of the questions before when he was talking about preferences and like people wanting to support their country or their religion. And he said something which I think we all just need to be honest about, which is sometimes we're gonna have to talk to people in other disciplines, right? I mean, I think that that's just like a big point that I think that, that we have to take seriously, that sometimes we're not gonna be the people best positioned to understand. I think we're really good at taking your preferences given and then figuring out what to do given those preferences. But we're not that good at like saying, well, you know, your preferences really should be more for, you know, not polluting. Like, we don't know how, but that's not our job. Like, maybe the theologians or the philosophers, maybe somebody understands that question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a cop out of an answer, but I think we, you know, over specialization is, is a really dangerous phenomenon in academics. And I was privileged to serve on the University of Chicago press board and saw proposals from other groups within the university, and you see it. I mean, over specialization is a big problem. So we should always be open to talking to people in other groups. And the great thing about business schools is we have other groups in our school that we can easily talk to to try to make progress on that. Uh, along the same lines, and to be a little bit more polemic, a lot of this new frontier seems kind of like rehashing old debates like morality and the role of morality in markets that go from Adam Smith to Arrow talking about you don't want to be cheated. And yet here we are kind of as framing it as like this is a new frontier, a corporate finance. So are we kind of bringing out the pig again and then saying that this is our new idol? And <laughs> Like, just to kind of, because I felt I mean, like I'm kumbaya, I, I agree, but it's kind of like, it's been there, it's been like in the background, and now we're labeling it as a new frontier. Is that more of a pushing of a demand for this, or just? This is the open question, it's not the new frontier question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do whatever we want. Exactly. Technically, if you didn't answer the question before, it's still on the frontier. Exactly. <laughs> this is why, uh, you know, pretend it's the science. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to, I'm not going to try to summarize, just make a few housekeeping announcements. So um, first, one thing that the dean didn't do, but he should have given this crowd, is tell you that um, Booth is, is going to introduce, assuming the trustees agree, a new one-year master's in finance program next year. And so we'll be assuming this goes ahead by January, we'll be taking applications. A lot of you guys work in financial services firms on the side, and if you've got a side deal and you wanna hire somebody from Chicago that, that would actually be very well trained, we're gonna be producing such people, and you should talk to Stefan and Ralph, they're leading the charge on this, so if, if you're associated with anybody in financial services, uh, please please talk to them if, you, if you'd be interested in finding out more. Okay, so. 
yeah, we're going to do it differently. <laughs> and you've got no problem placing your people, as far as I can tell. Um, all right, so let me just uh, four points. So first of all, I think we should start by thanking the Clark's uh, Center and the Stigler Center staff. They did a lot of work here. Um, I, I think on behalf of the organizers, we want to thank certainly all the local faculty that came, but especially a lot of the out-of-towners, a lot of very prominent people here that aren't even on the program that came back and, and uh, added to the value of the discussion. And it's great to see you guys. We, we're really happy that you're here. And uh, thank, thank you, too. We videotaped this, and hopefully we've got good audio. Um, we'll try to come up with some summary, um, summary, some sort of summary event uh, that'll probably be clips of people. And so once that's ready, you'll, you'll be sent some sort of a notice so you can figure out where it is. We'll try to get people um, a way to be able to download some of the pictures that Beth was taking so that, that if you want to see those, particularly the group shots, um, so hopefully we'll, we'll do that well. And then finally, uh, dinner is just up in the winter garden. That's just up to the first floor. There's, um, there'll be a, a bar you can go up and get a drink. Uh, I think the plan is we'll sit down to dinner in like 15 minutes, but you can mix a little bit, figure out who you want to sit with. There's no assigned seating. Um, and, uh, we, we just want to close by saying thanks again. And, uh, we'll see you in another, uh, 125 years. <laughs>